The blizzard's blowing in. Your Grace, perhaps we'd best pitch camp and wait for clear weather. Ain't a bad idea. Said we might be waiting a week. Then we march on. We've no time to waste. While we ride to and fro begging aid, Nilfgaard grows in power. We must obtain reinforcements as quickly as possible and liberate our home. Watch your heads! <laughs> Looking to dance, mate! Listen to me, old lady. This harvest will be reaping black clad heads. The chase is on! Ballista, your command. Ever up a storm, knock out one of your teeth.
We'll catch them all! Eve rode on in silence, endeavoring to work out the length of her exile thus far. A scout's call tore her from her reverie. Your Grace! You must see this! With a grave mien, the soldier indicated a track in the snow. The hobnail bootprint was all too familiar. Meave had seen it before, upon Lyria's sandy tracks, and midst the ashes to which Edern had been turned. Nilfgaardian footmen! Seethed Meave. Marched through of late, interrupted Gascon. A day, perhaps two days, passed. The scouts had learned a Nilfgaardian caravan with an armed escort had recently arrived in Mahakam. The invaders had brought with them chests brimming with gold and jewels, then exchanged these for the finest Mahakaman forged swords and spears. A scout gave me one of the coins the black clads had used for payment. Upon the coin's back, the Lyrian Eagle. They pay with gold from my vault, the Queen said through gritted teeth. For arms that will cut down my fighting men and subjects. We might yet pursue and hunt them down, said Reynard, a spark in his eye. And make certain Epdahi never lays hands on those weapons. You might, again, piped up Gabor, who had been listening to their exchange. But you might also recall, we Mahakamans are neutrals who assure all guests within our borders safety. True? Formally speaking, the Nilfgaardians have passed outside them, but attack him a stone's throw from our gates, and you'll see Bruver's rage come out his ears as steam, and out his arse as fire. Gabor, forgive me, said the Queen. This caravan we must attack. I must stop the Nilfgaardians. And entirely apart, I should be quite content to watch Bruver spew fire. Gabor's mouth gaped as he tried to protest. But the Lyrian soldiers' laughter drowned out his grunts. Meave gave the signal to depart. Soon after, Queen and company descended upon the foe's caravan and a battle ensued. I smell a leak. Wise choice. I think you'll really like this one. I 
said I wish to capture the transport. Oh. Order! Have it the white of an eye from half a league away. to the front yet again. Willing and how but these damn boots are killing me. The transport's ours. Crushed by their defeat, the Nilfgaardians tossed the chests into the snow lining the road and rode off with the cracking of their whips. One chest burst open, revealing a weapon wrapped in greased leather. Gascon removed the leather and held aloft a sihil that shone with newly forged luster. He examined it from all sides, then put his thumb to its blade. Blood immediately squirted out. Ooh! Sharp bastard! He said, clearly impressed. Hearing these words, Gabor unexpectedly burst out laughing. What's got you so tickled, if you don't mind my asking? <laughs> Custom holds the first words out a warrior's mouth upon seeing a sill become the blade's name. So, <laughs> congrats, you've dubbed it. <laughs> Gascon stood there awkwardly as Meave took the weapon from him. I'd have chosen a different name personally, one with a bit more dignity. But Sharp Bastard has an undeniable charm. And I cannot wait to try it out on Nilfgaardian plate. Aye, but perhaps nay in Mahakam, Gabor interjected. You've made a fine enough mess for yourselves, as is. Gonna need to mend for it somehow. And that'll nae be easy. Tidings of Meave's deeds soon reached Bruva Hoog's meaty ears. And though there was no fire, despite Gabor's insistence to the contrary, there was also no doubt the Elder-in-Chief was livid. Only the Zigrin's intercession on their behalf kept the Lyrians from being thrown out of the mountains. Your Majesty, allow me once again to express my undying gratitude. You're most welcome, Barnabas, but please, we haven't need for any formalities when speaking alone. I, uh, 
Well, 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 of course. Uh, how might I help you, then? I like to know... No, I must know who I travel with. Please do tell me about yourself. About me? <laughs> um... I've most civil relations with dwarves, <laughs> as you saw. Uh, but, um... Is there anything in particular you'd like to know? Why not start at the beginning? Tell me where you hail from, perhaps. Oh, right, right. Uh, well, uh, I was born in the distant south, in Tia Tokhair. My mother was a washerwife, my father an armourer. Soon as I'd passed 40 winters and could strike out on my own, I left the family, my native parts. So I've been on the road now about, um... Oh, 20 odd years? Indeed. A rather long while. Did the South simply not suit you? Well, I wouldn't say that exactly. It's just staying would have meant stepping into my father's shoes. Then, forging blade after blade, plate after plate. Oh, just thinking on it sets my head a spinning. Not for me, that, no. No, nature. The world so rich in mysteries, in wonders left to discover, and ways to make it a better place. By building bombs that explode in the hand, for instance. Ah, as those bearded fellas say, Mahakam wasn't he built in a day. <laughs> Besides, uh, nobody was seriously hurt by those malfunctions. Not many, at any rate. At the moment, have you any invention you've worked on? One that's near complete? Oh, so kind, so wonderful, you should ask. See, I've, uh, I've ever had an avian fascination. Uh, for birds, you see. Their wings, bones. The structure's perfect. The aerodynamicism, the, the, the plumage. In short, I believe I can fly. I beg your pardon? Yes. Yes, I, I'm learning to fly. 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 You've not misheard. I, Barnabas Beckenbauer, will be the first norm... Oh, what am I saying? The first mammal to free himself of the soil's bondage and soar to the clouds. Hmm. But aren't bats also... Ha! <laughs> A detail! This is no time to be petty. No, but frankly, my preparations are far advanced and I'm rather optimistic about my design and prospects. I've calculated every trajectory, every force, it all works out. Just need to do a few more field tests. Did you have volunteers try it, or did you test the design yourself? Naturally, I must stay on the ground. Who take all the measurements elsewise? Uh, luckily, there's no lack of thrill seekers in Mahakam. More eager to etch themselves into the annals. My first prototype. The Sky Licker, I dubbed it. Oh, Your Majesty, if you'd only seen the beauty. Flew over a hundred and twenty L's. Truly? Colour me impressed indeed. He must have made quite the name for himself, your brave volunteer. I'm certain he's caught the eye of every she-dwarf in Mahakam since. Uh, oh, no, he's dead. Uh, the, the landing, it was rough. And then a bear sauntered by. Uh, didn't help any. Uh, anyhow, as he died, the dwarf swore he regretted nothing. Brave lad. A bit daft, though. <clears throat> I see. But the next time you request I try one of your inventions, I'd ask you to remind me of this touching tale. Time I attended to other matters. Hmm? Ah, yes, you're still here. Off you go, then.
It's going to be a right good levy. Big and beautiful. Greetings. What is it? If anyone asks, you've not seen me. We shan't pass this way. Oh, rain it. Whatever would we do without you? Plummet off the cliff like lemmings, no doubt. Meave squinted and gazed off into the distance. It seemed to her that hundreds of black patches covered the peaks on the horizon. Once she had ridden up closer, she realized these were the windows of homes carved out of solid rock. Our pride this was, sighed Gabor. Burrows Rump. A city carved out of mountain rock. Hundreds of miles of tunnels, dozens of steelworks, smithies and forges. Now, it's a vast lair to monsters. They ooze from underground, weave their nests, hatch their young, and when hunger hits them in the gut, they prowl down into the pass. Meave stood at the entrance to the underground city. The monumental gate, cast in bronze, lay on the ground, folded multiple times as a scroll of paper. Out of blackened windows oozed a stench of rotting meat and mold. The queen bent an ear to hear water dripping, and, in the distance, a metallic scraping. A sound akin to chitinous scales rubbing against rock. The soldiers await your order, Your Grace, said Reynard quietly, as if he feared he would wake the beasts asleep in the caverns. Do you recall my words as we fled Lyria? Said Meave, turning to Reynard. You swore you would retake your crown, even if you had to penetrate hell to do so. Time to follow that oath. The queen inhaled deeply and stepped forward, her sword raised and prepared to strike or parry. Moments later, it was swinging, fighting, as the current tenants of Borrow's Rump came out to meet her. Gnomes don't run so fast. You know, in case you were planning to skip out on the quick. Yeah. 
You mad? Don't shake that! Ah, damn it! They'll hatch it! Place is about to swarm with creepers! There's a time to reap, a time to sow. I've hit the white of an eye from half a league away. This could hurt. Aye. Though wounded, Meave approached the Shaelmar, which lay writhing on the ground. She then ran her sword through its heart, finishing it. Yet so spent was she that she lacked the strength to pull her blade from between the plates of the chitinous armor. The beast there took me, she whispered. It was very close. The Lyrians reached a vast hall that had once served the clans as their meeting room. The stone benches were covered in sticky slime and insectoid eggs, while bats of varying size hung from the crystal chandeliers. Gascon rummaged through old, weathered bones, surely hoping to find something of value. Gabor, in turn, was at a shut and locked door, grappling with it as if it were a deadly beast. The door finally gave way with a sigh, and the dwarf raised his arms in a triumphant gesture. It's a storeroom! Should hold miners' tools aplenty, he said, enthused. Some barrels of alchemical brews in here, too. Lucky there's no sign of moisture. 
They haven't they soaked through? All we've got to do is roll them out into the corridor and set a bit of fire to them. And woof! We'll have sealed the beasts off from the pass once and for all. Meave treated the dwarves' instructions as hallowed. Soon after, the mountains trembled from a powerful explosion. Rubble came down and blocked the tunnels. They say the plumes of smoke escaping the window openings in the rock could be seen as far as Aldersburg. Dark clouds hovered over the horizon, and a strong gale snapped their banners. Damn it, a storm's coming. Gabor, take us to the nearest settlement. We must seek shelter. Soon the Lyrians arrived in Stoolcamp. The town square proved full of folk. Several dozen dwarves laden with large sacks and satchels stood about in smaller groups. When a thick snow began to fall, the dwarves cheered. Tears streamed down the cheeks of several, but Meave could not tell if they issued from some fortuitous occurrence, or if the strong wind had wrung moisture from their eyes. What is it we witness? Why do they rejoice at a snowstorm? Asked Meave, pulling her hood over her head. Well, the blizzard's good cause to postpone their expedition by another day, Gabor responded. See, they've been conscripted by drawn lots to be settlers found homes in a village in Blackbrook Vale. Seven expeditions have gone that way already, and none survived longer than a year. Valley's cursed, and no two ways about it. Intrigued, Meave proceeded to speak with the settler's leader. He confirmed Gabor's claim. He had buried many a previous colonist. All had been abnormally thin, pale, prematurely greyed, as if some wraith had drawn the lifeblood out of them. Once the dwarf had finished his tale, he gripped the queen's hand firmly and, promising a generous reward, begged that she and her Lyrians accompany the expedition to Blackbrook Valley. Taint far. Mere few leagues north along the main road. We'll make the march much easier to came with the whole army, in case of any danger. I know not how useful our swords can be against curses and spectres, said Meave. But leave you bereft and in need I will not. We shall march with you into Blackbrook Vale and see to it that you are safely arrived. Then we will march on. The dwarf sped off to announce the good tidings to his settler brethren. By the time the blizzard had abated, they were ready to march. Be bold. Take on challenges, risks even. But before you set out to do anything, buy yourself some proper insurance. Always darkest for the dawn. Or when the last candle in the mine goes out. Waiting's painful. Forgetting's painful. But an arse dragged across cinders is the worst kind of suffering. Fall down seven times, get a bait. Then clobber the dunderhead who keeps shoving you. Fall down seven times, get a bait. Then clobber the dunderhead who keeps shoving you. Stay clear of Boros Rump. Unless you like shale mars, that is. The Elder gets a wee stranger every year. Scary to think where he'll be a hundred from now. Oh, I'd cut my beard. But I haven't yet received written permission. Stay clear of Boros Rump! Unless you like shit. 